I'm Walter Block. I'm Jody Emery. This is Adam Kokesh. I'm Jeffrey Tucker. I'm Ben Swan. I'm Tom Woods. I'm Peter Schiff. I'm Eric Voorhees. And you're listening to... And you're listening... And you're listening... You're listening... You're listening to... Ed and Ethan. Soak up the awesomeness. Listening to Ed and Ethan, the voice of liberty in Canada, coming to you from Saskatoon, the province of Saskatchewan, in the cold, frozen wastes of Kanakistan. Actually, it's pretty warm up here. Uh, my intrepid co host today is not the incredible Ed, it's Andrew. Andrew joins me once again. Welcome back. Hey. Nice hey. to be back. <laughs> you sound more excited this time. Last- I, I wasn't quite as awesome yesterday as I was last time. Oh, it, I don't understand where we're going with that. So I have to continue through. Yeah. We're good. <laughs> Okay, uh, we are, I'm of course your uh, your intrepid host, no I said modest host, modest, I'm modest, your modest host Ethan, you're listening to us on Daily Paul Radio at dailypaulradio.com as well as LRN, LFR, no wait, uh, L, Free Far, all kinds of different stuff, Freedom's Phalanx, we're on VVN, we're everywhere, we're, we're everywhere you want to be, right, does that sound right, yeah. Hey, are we? Are we really, though? <laughs> I don't know. Um, we are going to... Okay, we're going to continue with the format that Ed and I pioneered on our last show, which is basically, instead of doing all the news reviews and all that good stuff, uh, at the start of the show, we're going to start out today with our guest. He is Tur de Meester. Tur is a self-taught economist, an entertaining little lad from Belgium, and he is full of ooey gooey brain juice um knowledge and wisdom i don't know tur is that a good intro <laughs> do, uh, do yes i'm very flattered <laughs> you like the the ooey gooey brain wisdom thing that I was love good it. yes okay good stuff actually tur you uh you last time we had you on um I had the computer eat everything that you gave us. It was a great interview. Actually, Andrew was here for that. Yep. And uh, yeah, everything got wiped out. So we're going to have to replicate the awesomeness of what that was. Do you think we can do that? I'm feeling the pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it, it would, it, we'll, we'll, we'll bear through it as best we can. Um, so before we, before we go forward into asking you uh, about uh, libertarianism and anarchy, that kind of stuff, I want to ask you to give me a better sort of overview of your background, because you are a self-taught economist, but you have had interactions with uh, academics uh, in, in, in the field of economics. You have read uh, Ludwig von Mises' Human Action, which frankly... Uh, tells me that you have a brain uh, able to comprehend very complex topics. That is a difficult read. Uh, so what's what's your background? How did you get into economics? Um, and and uh, uh, just kind of give me a, an overview of your journey in that respect. So um, I, when I was like 18, I, I just, the only thing I knew was I had no clue what I wanted. So I just tried different things and uh um, I, luckily, studying in Belgium is is cheap if you're at a state university, so you you can try different things. I also was a a volunteer for a year in Norway, and um, uh, when I was a student, I encountered a group of people that were starting a Sudbury school, which is um, like a uh, a school structured around the philosophy of unschooling. Mm. And mm. through that, I met some people that were reading. Uh, like underground newsletters that were not really in the mainstream. And uh, one of those newsletters mentioned um, a book on uh, democracy, and it was Democracy the God That Failed by mm. this gentleman called Hans Hermann Hoppe. And then through that, we discovered that there's this whole school called the Austrian School. And uh, we're like, me and my friends were quite um, academic, uh, even though we didn't really like what's, what was being taught at university. Um, so we founded the Rothbard Institute because we didn't find what we we're looking for, like a, a Mises-like institute in Europe or like for ourselves to organize seminars and um, work around the, this, this very, very exciting theory. So I did that for about, I think, two and a half, three years. I uh, was active in the Rothbard Institute, uh, translated two books and... Uh, but then I saw this economic crisis on the horizon, and it arrived pretty quickly in, in 07, 08. Um, and I was working in sales at the times because uh, if you want to be rich, uh, libertarian institutes and unschooling schools <laughs> in Europe, it's not really going to work. So I was, I was working in sales, but 
even there I felt quite trapped. So I tried to like figure out like what can I do to um, use this Austrian economics knowledge to make a way for myself to solve some of my own problems. And that became uh, an economic newsletter, financial newsletter. Uh, so I did that for also about three years. Uh, and uh, I was lucky to be an early Bitcoin adopter. I uh, bumped into Bitcoin and I thought it was a great way to um, diversify your cash positions. Mm. I've been um, like ever since 11, 2011, I thought stock markets were being becoming like artificially inflated because of all the money printing. So I was looking for cash. But of course, if there's lots of money printing, then um, you, you don't want to be in paper money. So gold, silver, Bitcoin. And so that led to me being involved in Bitcoin for the past uh, three years now. Uh, I've done a lot of the Bitcoin conferences. I made a couple of investment in this space as well. Right. And um, yeah, that's so basically my background. The The Bitcoin thing, when did you first recommend in your newsletter that Bitcoin be purchased by your readers? So I started writing about it in late 2011. I knew about it since the summer, but I, I just started out, so I wanted to like be careful and uh, started writing about it in late 11, late 2011. And mm -hmm. my first recommendation, I really I added it to the portfolio when it was five dollars in January 2012. <laughs> it's trading mm -hmm. around what 620 US today, give or take, something like that. Yeah, we we did 100x, so yeah, uh, that was yeah. pretty good. Not bad. Hey, uh, Tur, I was uh, wondering a little bit about, you said that you're involved in an unschooling uh, school, or, or is it something along those lines? Could you right. clarify a little bit what that is? Yeah, so um, in 1968, um, in Framingham, Massachusetts, a couple of people founded what's uh, known as Sudbury Valley School, and uh, it was built on the principles, on the one hand, of... Uh, the New England town model, like direct democracy, a, a gathering of every week where everybody has a vote to uh, decide on, on some, like how, how to keep the community safe, basically. And then on the other hand, it's founded on the principle that every human being has a right to pursue their own happiness. And so in the school, there is liberty. Uh, there is no set curriculum. There are no age groups. Um, and everybody's free to pursue their own um projects yeah. in, in that environment. So this is a, an actual school, a place that people go to collectively, right, to get together. Am I right? Uh, it, exactly. They have about 200 students. It fluctuates between 150 and 200 over the years. Uh, and uh, students spend about between, uh, I think, five and eight hours a day in the school. They're, it's pretty flexible if you want to pursue activities outside outside the school that the school doesn't have facilities for you can you can get that arranged as well mm. so they're they're kids between four and 18 years of age yeah. and that's that's become a model people become inspired by it and so that's why people talk about Sudbury schools schools that are inspired on this this model there's about um i i think there's about 30 of those schools around the world and we we started one uh, in belgium and then i later helped start one in holland as well Right, uh, you sort of mentioned that there was, uh, like, there, there, they would people would show up, and there wasn't really any structure to it. They would kind of do what they want. And uh, could you kind of speak to the rationale behind why uh, they came up with that type of system? Yeah, actually, there is uh, a, there's a lot of structure in the school, uh, but the structure is built around. Uh, keeping people safe and maintaining a, a culture of respect, uh, mutual respect, and also uh, allowing the school to be run smoothly, like a, a marketplace where you can get, you know, where you can get your needs met, where you can provide services, where you can receive services, where also the parents know what's going on in the sense like they, they there is predictability. Um, uh, because you, you're gonna have four-year-olds walking around there unsupervised, mm -hmm. so you really need to be very careful. So it is. I mean, there is a, a very clear structure. Uh, if you look at the rule book of the school, for example, there's there's, uh, I'd say at least over thirty pages of uh, of rules. Uh, but within the structure, you're free to pursue your own projects. Uh, right. Absolutely, and yeah. and that's what confuses people because you know nobody's. There is no like adult saying, "Oh well, you're done with this, and now I'm going to evaluate you. You get a, yeah. an eight out of ten, and now we're going to move on to the next thing." 
I mean, it is possible for that to happen, but only if students request it themselves. Right. Like, for example, you can request math classes, and then you gather maybe every week or, or, or more, more quickly. Uh, and then, of course, there will be these deadlines and there'll be these expectations, but uh, the start is, is a voluntary initiative from the student himself. Right. And just to be clear, what ages are we talking about for the students? Yeah, so 4 to 18. Um, okay. Most students will graduate at, um, I mean, what I experience is more like 17. If they've been in the school for a while, like at around age 17, they feel ready for like university or uh, other pursuits. Hmm. So, so Tur, that does bring me to a question. Obviously, when these uh, unschooled sorts of kids graduate, um, you know, they have not gone through the public education system that we are traditionally familiar with, so obviously they graduate to a cardboard box in misery and despair. Would that be fair, or, or are the outcomes somewhat different? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're miserable when they get out there. I mean, all that freedom, I mean, it, it just it messes them up. It's, yeah, terrible, yeah. terrible. What, what are the outcomes like for these students? Uh, well, do, is there's, there... actually, there's actually interesting material to be found. Um, if you go to the Sudbury Valley School website, uh, it's sudval, S-U-D-V-A-L dot com. They have a bookstore, and uh, one of the books, I think the book is called Pursuit of Happiness, Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but there's um, so they did two surveys among um, alumni uh, of this school, and that was actually the first data that I went uh, to to look for when I heard about the model. It's it sounded like a fantastic school for me. It's like wow, I would have loved it, but then immediately it was like, well, is it for everybody? And um, so the data is is pretty interesting. Um, if you look at how many. Students, for example, um, pursue higher studies after a Sabri school or specifically after Sabri Valley school. The percentage is um, 82 percent. So 82 percent pursue Mm. higher education within six years of graduating. And of course, for Europeans, like we wonder, like, why? Why this six years? And the reason is because um, students sometimes have to work first to uh, make some money so that they can pay for their uh, university, for example. And then the other number that I thought was really impressive is um, how many students um, become their own, um, how should I say, become self-employed, yeah. right? And that percentage is uh, 41% which is much, much higher than the average uh, population. Even if you look at uh, pri- what comes out of private schools in general, um, the, the percentage is much higher. Yeah. Huh. I'm, that's actually amazing. I, I it just, is, although, it, although it could be, and you know, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see similar numbers in the U.S. where the people come out of school and they can't find a job, and so they have no choice but to uh, <laughs> self-employ. <laughs> right. <Well. laughs> So it kind of depends. Well, the welfare way. checks is not the same as that's true. Welfare. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, to me, look, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, the discussion that that focuses on unschooling, homeschooling, uh, that sort of thing, is it seems to be bolstered heavily by. Uh, fear. You, look, what what will the outcomes be? And that's specifically why I asked you about un- outcomes, because a lot of people, I, I've been approached so many times by people that tell me, look, there are absolutely kids out there that you, you got to admit there are kids out there that they, they would be hopeless without a structure. They would be lost. Uh, they would never, ever be helped if, if they uh, didn't have a public school to go to, uh, an authority figure to tell them what to do, uh, a curriculum to tell them how to learn. Uh, they would just be lost in the world, the ether of the world. Um, and that's never well, made a lot of I, sense to me. Can I interrupt? I mean, like, I, I, you know, hearing that always... It, it kind of pisses me off because <laughs> because oftentimes these are children that come from families where they are they've been unparented right where parents mm. have not taken responsibility um, and where they've they come from a very unsafe environment uh, unsafe family environment and then of course the expectation is that the school is going to fix it and that you know um, and and I mean and of course these these children are children that then are drawn towards like authoritarian structures because that's what they usually know like this this whimsical authority uh, if you look for example there was a recent article i think it was new york times uh, that shows that um um uh, the military um uh, people that have joined the military voluntarily 
uh, on average have much higher rate of adverse childhood experiences. So people, young people that grow up in authoritarian environments, they seek the same thing later on. Uh, and if you put a, a child like that in a Sudbury school, yeah, they're, they're going to have problems. I'm, 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 I don't doubt it. And I've seen it. So is that, does that indicate some level of, uh, I hate to use the word, uh, hopelessness for those who uh, have, be have come out of these authoritarian structures that they may want to pursue some sort of unschooling environment? I mean, how do these people then uh, integrate into a system that you see as beneficial, which is more about freedom of the individual? So are you talking about children or uh, parents, like uh, people that want to become parents? I think both, because this would be a shared experience. I mean, not people that want to become parents. Let's just assume uh, parents of uh, a child and they, they, they are parents that uh, don't really understand their way. They are authoritarian because it's all they know. The child is thusly uh, authoritarian as well, or at least uh, sympathetic to authoritarian structures. I mean, it, it, how how do these people then introduce themselves to a system that is more about freedom and free will? Oof, uh, I, <laughs> huh. I, th I think I think there, you want to tackle the root problem first, and that means that these these people they want to look back into their history. They want to go to therapy and figure out what happened to them and and what is what was right and what is wrong. I mean, they've been taught this language of of abuse and dysfunction. So if they want to learn to speak this other language, first they have to understand uh, deeply what happened to them, and then they can start making decisions. Otherwise, they will just operate on like this. Um, you know, they're being prog they they've been programmed this way, and if they don't uh, actively investigate and reprogram themselves, I think they're just setting themselves up for a, a lot of stress, a lot of struggle, and then I would even say, don't do it. Right, just. Uh, just go with what you're more comfortable. Well, I mean, like I'm not advocating people sending their children to authoritarian schools, but um, yeah, it just creates a lot of tension for the child. For example, if he's allowed to go to a, a more free environment and the parents don't really believe in it, right? Mm -hmm. When they think, oh, it's like a playground. When you're back at home, we'll like we'll make sure that you uh, you know we'll try to imbibe all the things that you you missed into you with force. Uh, that's really screwed up. And then if the child keeps going to the Sudbury school, for example, he's going to get in trouble because he's going to act out all the stress onto the other children perhaps. And uh, and so he'll become like a like stigmatized potentially as, as a bully or as somebody who doesn't fit in, whereas the actual problem is his home environment. Mm. See, that's I think it's important to address that because a lot of people have no conception as to how on earth you transition into these systems of, of freedom, of free will, because oh, this is more than just about Sudbury schools. This is more than uh, just how, how people are educated. You addressed it. You mentioned it. The root problem, what sort of psychological traumas people experience earlier in life, what sort of uh, structures they grow up with, it's very important. Right. You, can't, you can't ignore uh, those problems uh, before addressing uh, other issues, right? I mean, like one 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 thing that I'm like that comes to mind is okay. Well, imagine you um, you you kind of come from a regular background or a more authoritarian background, and you read this this book um, um, that uh, or there's YouTube videos where these um, uh, Sudbury Valley alumni talk about their experience and how wonderful it was and what they've learned. So I mean the the final product is amazing. I mean, people are just, you know, they, they, they know themselves, they tackle their own problems, they're entrepreneurial. So obviously that's going to appeal to a lot of parents like, oh, I want my child to become like that. Well, the exercise that I would suggest to like aspiring parents is to uh, bring up this um, approach to their family, right? Because mm. if you send your kids to a school like that, to a sub school, your own parents are going to start talking about it. They're going to ask you questions. And rather than just doing that and then tackling the questions later, how about bringing this topic up in the family table and just seeing how they respond to this very different approach? Same with unschooling, right? If you want to unschool your kids and like your wife is pregnant or you're thinking about getting kids, well, talk about this very different approach, see how your parents respond. And if they respond very defensively, very negatively, 
well then it seems like there's something for you to to work on to investigate um why are these people like this um what kind of a relationship am i actually having with them hmm. does it, that make sense it does make sense to me i i it's about addressing root issues right trying to figure out what what is it that could obstruct uh, your movement into something more free, something more uh, uh, less focused on on uh, on authoritarian sort of control and direction. In the in the two and a half minutes we have left, I, before we hit the break, and we're going to go into the second half more with Turdam Easter, the exciting Dane of wisdom. I don't know. I, yeah, it's, I just come up with labels on the fly; they don't work. Uh, it, <laughs> could you tell me? Did, your background sounds like it was more normal. Did you? Uh, was there anything in spe- specifically that got you interested in this philosophy of unschooling or or free schooling, uh, whatever you want to call it? Yeah, just uh, three words. I hated school. <laughs> I really yeah. hated it. So you- and also, well, actually, no. My my uh, elementary school, I did in a um, alternative type school. I half of it, at least. I, I spent. Uh, I think uh, four years in a, a Frené school, which is a French approach, which is a bit more free. And it was a new school. So it was all new teachers. People were very excited. And then from there, when I was 12, I went to this arcane Catholic, ugh, like I just, it, I get shivers <laughs> thinking about it, this kind of child sausage factory. Um, hmm. And uh, yeah, that really messed me up. And uh, so I was, I was, uh, also, I was working in the Boy Scouts, uh, not really working, but active there. So working with kids, and I enjoyed that. And for some time, I was thinking about becoming a teacher, but uh, even did the teacher program. Uh, mm. And then, like, being confronted again at age uh, 18 with this arcane school system, it really, I mean, like, how youths would treat it, right? How very young children are, are being treated, that really... Um, I don't know, set off a lot of questions. And that I think that's what caused me to be open for things like unschooling and slippery later on. Right. But did your did your parents have any influence, do you think, on, on uh, at least inspiring some sort of a, a desire for free will? Uh, did Was there any influence there that you can nail down? Well, I mean, like, it's more like they allowed me to... Um, I remember in they allowed me to change school if I wanted to, so that that option was there, and I guess that um, that allowed me to to think and consider schooling as like an option, even as a, a child, like it's something that you can choose. Uh, right. Whereas I imagine for uh, a lot of other kids, it's maybe it's maybe m- more authoritarian and and more restrictive. Yeah, and I reflect on my own background as, you know, uh, hippie flower children parents. Uh, they, it's not as though they didn't, uh, they didn't uh, appreciate to some degree the authoritarian schooling system, but uh, it was much more about free will, freedom, and uh, peace, love, and happiness, yo. Uh, so, so I think for me, that was an advantage. I really enjoyed that. And I, I look back upon that, I reflect upon that as being one of those things that inspired uh, a want for free will, a recognition of the value of free will. Because, you know, a lot of people, they grow up in these environments where that recognition just doesn't make logical sense. Free will, hey, everybody gets beaten, right? Um, We're going to be back on the other side of the music after the break. We're going to return and talk more with uh, the one and only Tur Demeester, Danish economist and man of wisdom. Raconteur, is that? All right, man. Uh, we'll be back right after the music. Thanks so much for sticking with us right here on dailypaulradio.com. Continue listening. This is Ed and Ethan. And today, Andrew. We know sometimes you can get caught up in a situation where you're just trying to kill time. Okay, okay, I'll tag along, because if I don't go, I'll get dragged along. And so I go with her just to get it over with it. I take my iPod so it could be over quick. She buys clothes and clothes and more clothes until the store closes, and she don't even know if they fit. Buy me Gucci, buy me As a public service, you can count on the Ed and Ethan podcast to help you out. Oh, look, a sale on handbags. Enjoy the show. Shoes by Dior and Jimmy Choo. Hi, this is Fergus Hodgson, host of The Stateless Man and editor of thestatelessman.com. A home for those who pursue individual liberty beyond arbitrary borders, oppressive governments, and myths of national obligations. That's international living, financial independence, and personal sovereignty. 
Be sure to tune in and follow on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash The Stateless Man and on Twitter at The Stateless Man. All right, we're back. And by the way, okay, so through the break, um, Tur asks me, why all the Danish references? I say, well, you're from, wait, Belgium. Oh, yeah, yeah, That's mm-hmm. that was really not, that's, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, no, not Danish. Uh, we have been invaded by every European country <laughs> known to man, so yeah. who knows, I have some Danish blood, that's so, possible. Uh, there, perfect, that's what I meant, obviously, <laughs> right? So yeah, It's uh, the inflection, I'm sure, it's my inflection. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know, I think I just, uh, maybe it's because I think of Danish folks and, and they're kind of adorable and Tur, you're adorable so that i don't know maybe that's what it is oh thank you (laughs) anyway yeah so andrew is there a particular place you wanted to start because we've talked about education a lot do you want to continue with that well i'm just kind of wondering you know Tur, like uh i'm guessing you uh you probably got a lot of your education on your own free time right and and i'm not and not don't mean just in the last few years but growing up uh, I mean, do you think that we um, we undervalue the educational benefits of of playing and uh, uh, mm. you know doing what we want as kids? Um, I I feel like I missed a lot. I feel really like I I remember um, waiting. You know, like that was what I associated with high school. It was like, um, and I kind of brushed it off because it was too painful to really talk about it as, as what it was like this kind of uh, prison like environment. But so the way I would talk about it is like this six year holiday uh, because I saw these people working and, and what I was doing was, I felt like I was just bumming around. I was just, didn't have right. to, you know, I, I could, I could pass my exams without studying too much. So I was just doodling in class and uh, like, like, Oh, sorry. There is, Oh, by the way, I haven't mentioned I'm, I'm like, Renting a place like on top of the railroad tracks here in uh, <laughs> Philadelphia, so yeah, <laughs> that's okay, Tur. If you if you are accompanied by the sounds of commerce and movement, I think that's okay. Yeah. That that suits the show. <laughs> I feel like uh, Detective Mills in Seven. Like you know, <laughs> this whole room is shaking whenever trains <laughs> passing by. So so okay, you you refer to this time kind of wasted as like a, as almost a holiday. Uh, you, you you look back on this as kind of unproductive. Is that yeah? Is that like right? I'm kind of getting the yeah. sense that so it was... my my productive time was like um, yeah, in the evenings or the weekends maybe or uh, the holidays. Um, but I don't know. Like there was a whole period in my uh, early teens, uh, I guess, that I just didn't read books at all. I was like a I was devouring books up until I was 14 I think and then there's this gap of like four years in which yeah I read newspapers and magazines but the books were like I I just I don't know it was like uh well what was the shift like what what was there's just something that happened around that time that uh... um yeah so what started happening is just I started becoming depressed and uh, yeah. I like later discovered that the cause was in in my family and how dysfunctional my family was but at the time I I don't know I thought it was me or I I just had no clue what was going on um and um I think well that c- contributed to like not being able to consume like large texts and long things that would take my mind too much of like the my immediate needs um, but so, and for, for quite a while, uh, up until my early twenties, I thought the cause was school itself. I thought I, I'd become depressed because of this. Um, and probably, it probably contributed to it, but I thought it was because of school. Hmm. I, that's, uh, that seems important to hit on because if you, you know, a lot of kids, it seems like they go through school, they're unhappy with their experience. They're unhappy with life in general. They're succumbing to a lot of stresses um that doesn't seem at all conducive to learning and and andrew asked you earlier about you know this do we devalue things like playtime things like just hanging out with friends or uh you know consuming and devouring a novel for fun and not for the sake of pursuing the understanding of a scientific theory or uh, necessarily that type of thing right so right 
Yeah, I, I look for me. I I reflect on that time in school, and I you know I used to resent it a great deal. I think I've kind of finally moved past that. But but uh, I resented a great deal because before I had entered the public school system, I was a very happy kid, very smart, uh, well spoken, and then I went to what I considered was an educational uh, kind of shell of a uh, an organization. It just you know, mm-hmm. shortage of teachers, shortage of paper in the printers for crying out loud. <laughs> Old computers. Uh, I remember uh, wandering into a science class one day late because I didn't care about it. And the, the teacher asked me, Jen, just where do you think you've been? I, I, <laughs> I was reading a book. It was a lot more interesting than you, Mr. Larkham. Mm. <laughs> so, uh. so, so that was my experience with school. And I think, I think uh, you know, I... I just I look back on it and I cannot figure out how does that inspire learning because schools so often have this mission statement of, you know, expanding our intellectual capacity and inspiring students, but they don't. So, yeah, uh, thinking about it, the takeaway for me is that um, you need certain things before you can flourish and before you can, like, have this this curiosity that's expanding and, like, being creative. And I, I think safety is one of those major, major um, things that you need as, as a – it's necessary. And, uh, like, thinking back, that was definitely not the case for me. Uh, as a young teenager, like it wasn't safe at home, it wasn't safe in school. There was like bullies in school, not really against me, but the atmosphere was kind of like mm, acidic, I would say. And uh, like there were stories about teachers throwing, uh, what is it, like the the thing you use to wipe off the blackboard with? Oh, the th- eraser. Yeah. yeah, they would throw that at kids. Uh, I, I personally experienced teachers, I think uh, three different teachers uh, that would uh, get kids to cry because they were such bullies in class towards the kids Mm. Uh, just all kinds of these stories that now like you know come back but it's it's the whole culture of of like um i mean how can you be creative if you can be bullied uh, any moment in time or if you can be sent to the principal or if you gotta ask permission to you know go to the bathroom for crying out loud Mm. i mean how can you like flourish in an environment like that i've seen kids that are that are actually stopped growing we we like we had uh, new kids come in every now and then, new students, and some of those kids actually had stopped growing because they were so stressed. Yeah, you know, I, I hear you know anecdotes like like that, and I you know I just get the sense that this is what's normal. I mean, you you hear about people and they go to school and like it's the same story everywhere. You know, bullies are doing their thing. You know, uh, teachers are stressed out. Everyone is stressed out. You know, I I almost kind of think that the system is so fundamentally flawed. Everyone is trying to cope with this incredibly broken system, and uh, and uh, I think that's kind of what ends up happening is everyone is is dealing with it in their own way. It's like a yeah. massive, and, big... and that, that's why I think it's so important to just de-school. I mean, the old <laughs> paradigm it's it's broken. Don't try to fix it. Just you know. Work yeah. with people that you trust. I mean, it's it's really a black box as well. If you send your kids to school, who are these people that are going to teach, quote unquote, your kids? And uh, who are the kids that they're going to be in class with? If you look at the prevalence of child abuse, it's enormous. So, I mean, chances are really high that your kid is going to be in the same environment uh, with other kids that have been beaten, that have been sexually abused, and they're going to act out all these traumas on your child there's a high chance that that's going to happen i mean i sure remember uh bullies that had that came from very dysfunctional backgrounds and i had to deal with them and that's very traumatizing and and i mean why would you want to do that to your child wow that's uh something i hadn't considered the very frightening black mm-hmm. box nature of school um if i could lift us just a little bit uh I know I saw a post of yours on Facebook that was really intriguing to me, and it was your experience with higher academics. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, we actually on this show have talked to uh, some libertarians, some anarchists that are involved in higher academics, but I am curious what your if you can explain what your experience has been because as a, as a very smart fellow who moved on to. Uh, higher education became interested in economics. Certainly, you have been you you you've spoken to uh, you know, some, I guess, libertarian economic theorist superstars. But are they 
I don't know exactly how to pose this question without being impolite. <laughs> I guess if could you give me your your general experience with libertarians in academic circles and your impression of them? Are you asking whether there is um, a whiff of hypocrisy to be uh, <laughs> discovered sometimes? A whiff of hypocrisy is an, is a very polite way uh, to put it. So yeah, is there? Um. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, like, if you are a libertarian and you're all about free markets mm. and uh, all those things and, and how entrepreneurs should be, like, go out there and take risks and that's going to, like, build and we're going to grow our way out of this um, out of this 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 um, dictatorial environment. And they proclaim all that from a nice, cozy uh, position of uh, tenure at a state university, then, yeah, I mean, I do smell this whiff of hypocrisy coming from that. And I think it's very, you know, I think these people better better not speak then. I mean, if that's really what they believe or if they really, you know, would like to, like, hold this tenure position and all that, I think it's just, uh, to me, it, it's, it's very disheartening for uh, young people out there to hear this. It's like, it's the same thing all over again. I mean, our parents often bring us up with the the message like do as i say not as i do and mm -hmm. then it's the same thing all over i mean these academics that are always like saying oh you should do this and that and i'm not doing it i mean how inspiring is that it's not it's 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 actually i would say insulting to mm -hmm. the next generation because the next generation is forced by tax money to pay for these people that are like you know, like priests have have these priest like speeches about uh, the free market. I mean, to me, it's 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 the opposite of uh, productive. I think there's a lot more um, to be done. If you want to be a philosopher, uh, why not become a, like a lens maker? Or, or I mean, like philosophers in the past were not professionals. Often, they'd have a day job, and then they would pursue wisdom in their own free time. Hmm. And I think that's that's a much more credible way uh, to do it. You know, make YouTube videos. Uh, but I mean, why would you entrench yourself in, in a statist, uh, environment surrounded by bureaucrats the whole day, having to like, uh, tone down your, your, your ideas, uh, having to battle all these bureaucratic wars with, uh, well, God knows what, I don't even want to know what's going on in there. But, uh, yeah. And I, I mean, like I encountered some of those people and, and I, I, um, I, I asked them questions and I encountered a lot of resistance in that area. And I mean, like, I, I get it. I mean, for a while I was pursuing an academic career myself. I thought I was going to become a professor in philosophy and uh, that um, um, uh, that 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 was going to be my future. It was going to be the Hayekian, uh, you know, the Hayekian approach where this is a theory by uh, Friedrich Hayek who said that ideas trickle down in society from the intellectual elites um, down to the, the people uh, but right now with the internet, that's that's absolutely no longer the case. Uh, you can really mm -hmm. just go into the, the barrier to entry has disappeared. Mm -hmm. If you have a lot of talent, if you want to go out there and have a message uh, that's that's well researched and well brought, then you're going to find an audience. So your experience with higher education and economics, are you saying then that economics kind of it's it's almost moving beyond the realm of university education that it really that's that's no longer even required um well there's some habits in the there is there is this aspect of thoroughness that I, I i was i learned to appreciate and that came from uh like i had that experience from people with an academic background like you know to do the research to use footnotes to to just be thorough uh and not take things for granted so i mean there's value there um i just mm. don't know whether you know so i'm not saying that um getting a degree is a bad idea um but i am like questioning um the usefulness of building a career in, in academics, especially if you, you want to venture in the economic realm. Sure. Because if you're also, if you're a tenured academic uh, and you make these statements about uh, society, about the state of the economy, there's zero accountability. You can say whatever you want. I mean, look at Krugman, look at all these <laughs> jokers. Uh, they can say whatever they want and they still get the same paycheck. If you're, uh, if you're an asset manager or if you're a newsletter writer and you say these 
stupid things, then your customer is going to fire you. And that's the way it should be, in my opinion. Right. But did you get the distinct, I mean, was there an absolutely unmistakable instance in which uh, you you saw an academic uh, suggest that you should become involved in academics for the sake of becoming involved in academics as opposed to uh, the sake of uh, advancing theory and uh, being productive? Oh yeah, actually there was. Uh, I had this uh, this paper I'd written about the the business cycle, and um, um, my first draft of that paper was very methodological. It was very um, how we should connect the Austrian school with this other school of thought, um, and that was like actually a very obscure approach uh, that I'm sure. I don't know. I was I was in doubt at the time. Like, well, are people going to want to read this? And because he encouraged me to like go further down this alley and and you know make a more detailed study, and I, and I asked him. I said like, but you know, there's only three four people in the world that are going to read this paper because they're uh, you know they're the only ones having expertise in this area. And he he like he was like laughingly said to me like, well, but. What do you expect? Do you expect taxi drivers to read your paper? And I was just baffled by that comment. It's like, well, I mean, what do you expect? Like, you know, are you only writing for two other people in the world? I mean, like, you're being paid this massive wage, and then that's how you give value back? I, I didn't understand that. Yeah, I kind of get the sense in academia there's sort of a culture that uh, uh, the elite – you know, they they solve problems amongst themselves, and they expect that uh, that their conclusions will be just widely accepted by those lesser than them. Mm. And that, that doesn't work like that. I mean, what what happens in academia is that it's it's it, they produce propaganda. Um, it's ex post rationalization of um, of these political decisions. That's eighty percent of what goes on in, in the soft sciences, in my opinion. Hmm. Uh, so there's these these decisions that are being made, and then you just need a scientific explanation yeah. for why this is the right way to do it. And that's why studying economics at a state university really frustrated me because it was all about policy. It was all about explaining policy, all about designing policy. And uh, ugh, I didn't want to be an excuse for government violence. <laughs> no, no, that's uh, – yeah. I, I, I don't know. It just seems to me like we're – you know, you talk about um, – First, where we start out schooling, you know, the the earlier grades when you're when you're a younger person, and then you move into the uh, post secondary or the higher education. You know, what what is it that really changes? So there seems to be kind of like a almost like a, a, a hangover from one system to the next, where there are still these really unfortunate cultural. Uh, I'm going to say dysfunctions that exist within even a higher educational system. And, and I think your experience kind of speaks to that. Well, I was just looking up, uh, looking at this OECD study uh, about the state of education. And in the OECD is basically, uh, there are over 30 countries. It's basically the Western world, uh, the mm. U.S., Europe, and uh, some other countries. And um, if you look at how the government is involved in education, what you see is if you look at... Um, schooling of youth below age 18 then in the OECD so in the western world 93% of the money spent is coming from taxes so it is it is uh, government money only 7% is private uh, and then if you look at tertiary education which is higher education then that changes and then there's a lot more private money uh, coming in because we're, we, we're coming closer to the marketplace, of course, and then it becomes important to have relevant information. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit more mild for um, colleges and universities. There's just more private money involved and there's more diversity and it's, it's, it's uh, more difficult to have this general statement about the whole the – whole, um, environment especially in the u.s there's a lot of private schools i'm sure there's great schools as well mm -hmm. um but um yeah i mean uh, my background is belgium and apart from um some mba programs that are supposedly pretty good i'm very skeptical about the state of education there <laughs> Yeah, oh, well, that's why I call it a hangover, right? As it's it's not the drunken, horrifying mess that we observed before, but I think there's an after effect that kind of amplifies and carries on into mm -hmm. higher education. Uh, 
Tur, I wanted to ask you a little bit about Bitcoin, uh, because we did mention it at the very start, and I was hoping to get your insights, because... Uh, we've got a lot of big news lately, right? So uh, Dell.com in the United States, a uh, $60 billion a year business. Uh, they accept Bitcoin. Dish Network accepts Bitcoin. Overstock.com accepts Bitcoin. Lots of merchant adoption taking place this year. Uh, and there seems to be, especially from some gold bugs, an insistence that this means that price goes down because these businesses convert their Bitcoin to cash uh, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> disaster for Bitcoin, right? To all of these merchants accepting it, terrible, terrible news. It's horrible. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't sleep well. No, no I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, like this phase for Bitcoin, in my opinion, uh, the next two three years for sure. Bitcoin is is a safe haven instrument mainly. It's uh, it's something like gold. It's something like an offshore bank account. Uh, to me, these these merchants accepting it is is great, but it's not going to be the main driver for uh, for price or for adoption. Uh, and of course, a lot of commentators are going to say, "Oh, it's these speculators." And well, yeah, I think yeah, it's the savers. The savers are going to drive Bitcoin adoption. Uh, oh, there's a train coming. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's a quiet one. Um, <laughs> So that's that's kind of my my thinking. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I'm not so focused on uh, well this this guy or that guy accepting Bitcoin. Mm. Uh, if you look at the charts, um, I think we saw a bottom uh, in uh, April on April 11th. Uh, I think we're gonna see uh, we might August September is gonna probably be the time when we're gonna retest the the highs of a thousand dollars. I'm not saying that's 100 percent sure, but I would give it like a a 75% chance that we're going to retest those those highs right um because wall street is getting involved more and more funds are uh, are looking at bitcoin and uh people will say like oh but we have all this stringent reg- regulation coming around bitcoin but as long as they don't uh, prohibit um institutions from buying bitcoin then there is not much of a problem if you accept the thesis that the driver fundamentally the next two three years is just going to be a safe haven instrument right yeah you know i uh i was thinking like what you said about how a big company like dell announcing that they're accepting bitcoin isn't necessarily going to drive adoption and uh you know i i tend to think that more of what will will drive the adoption is some sort of financial crisis and we Mm -hmm. saw something like like that happen last year in cyprus when uh, people couldn't get their money they we saw a spike in the price of bitcoin and so do you think that that, uh, that is sort of what is needed to really push it to the next level, uh, some sort of major financial crisis? I don't think that's what's needed, but I, I, I do think that's the perfect storm. That's the rocket fuel that, yeah. uh, I mean, and, and this is the fear of some, some of the bigger players in the Bitcoin industry, is that we'll see like a remake of the dot-com bubble. And uh, we could see this major spike where we like go to ten or twenty thousand dollars of Bitcoin, and then after that comes the hangover. So we like if there is a this kind of crisis idea, uh, maybe a big crash in the markets, right? Maybe some some bond markets that start to uh, deteriorate or crash, um, and that can, you know, uh, entrepreneurs they use prices to base their decisions on, and if the price of Bitcoin gets overheated temporarily, then a lot of investors or entrepreneurs might take uh, in the short term might make some wrong decisions, like what we saw with the dot com bubble, people piling in uh, money on 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 crazy websites like dogfood dot com and, and and stuff like that. So you know this is, but then again, I mean. Uh, if we are aware of this, I think if Bitcoin goes north of um, four thousand dollars, for example, five thousand dollars. If we go above that, then uh, I would definitely call it uh, overheated, um, and then we might see a lull after that for maybe one or two years, even. Right. Mm. I've got a couple more questions on monetary theory and Bitcoin, but we're running out of time. Tura, would you mind if we kept you for a bit of our after show as well on edandethan.com? We'll upload it to the website. Would that be okay? 
Yeah, I don't mind at all. You can just, uh, you know, you can pay me in Bitcoin. You know my address. <laughs> right. I, I can't use that old excuse, check is in the mail, right? Yeah. It doesn't work anymore in a Bitcoin It's instant world. these days, baby. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. So we'll keep you for a bit of an after show because I do have some questions. I want to ask you about the regression theorem uh, and, and Bitcoin. I've run into some discussion lately about, oh, Bitcoin's no good because it's not really money. Mm. You know, it'll go to zero eventually. Yeah. Like, uh, Peter Schiff made a bet uh, with the owner of Amagi Metals recently. I saw that, yeah. In, in respect. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's interesting. Um, before we go, just really quick here in the last few seconds, is there a place on the web to find you, Tur? Uh, yeah, just go to Twitter. Uh, just uh, Google my name, T U U R D E M E E S T E R, Tur de Meester. And uh, my first link, I think, is my Twitter account. That's where I post my Bitcoin stuff. If you want to friend me on Facebook then or follow me on Facebook, that's where I do the more philosophical uh, topics. Uh, Twitter Fantastic. is just Bitcoin. Fantastic. Alright, good stuff. Thanks a bunch, Tur. We're going to be back right after the music on edneathan.com. If you're on dailypaulradio.com, continue listening to all of the fantastic content that is here. You know you love it. Absolutely you do. Uh, check out the after show at edandethan.com for all of our stuff. Thanks a bunch for listening. This is Ed and Ethan. Ed and Ethan.